Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Tim Hustadinov, founder, co-founder of the uh, Integrate Cal Community Partners Benefit Corporation, or ICCP, involved in the cannabis industry. Lee Welter, Sacramento physician. Uh, John Cameron, author of Rewire, Rekill, development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation. Welcome to the show. We're on Channel 17 in Sacramento and uh, on the web at uh, uh, www.accesssacramento.org. Channel 17 on YouTube and on cable channels all over the place. Central banks, including the Federal Reserve and its uh, counterparts in other countries at the national level, and the International Monetary Fund at the uh, at the global level, uh, have created, in essence, ever since well, in, in the case of the U.S. Fed, ever since 1913, have had the ability to create money pretty much at will. I call it phony money, and I would argue that the phony money has enabled the phony wars that we have uh, on poverty and the uh, uh, phony uh, wars that we have on terrorism and any number of other things. Tear that apart from Wimpy put it very well. He said, I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. We are spending money that does not exist at the expense of acquiring huge debts and unfunded liabilities. Uh, current a national from Popeye. Okay. The current <laughs> national debt is uh, close to twenty trillion dollars. It's a lot of and money. doubled uh, during the Obama administration. But I it has, point out. yes. Yeah. But George Bush is to blame for all of everything that, that Obama. He, he doubled it as well. So yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. And George, George, it's, George it's exponential. Let's just be clear that George caused all the problems that that um, that that uh, our magnificent president, no, I can't even say well, it with but, a straight but face. does it really yeah. matter if these people, supposedly responsible people, are not addressing this problem, it tells us something, there's something at the core of it that's, that's not really very healthy. Mm. And the unfunded liabilities, in other words, the entitlement things <coughs> that are on autopilot, stretching on forever as it currently stands are well in excess of a hundred trillion dollars. That's just wretched, basically unmanageable. And when you talk about it, they have show scary images of what is George Bush pushing an old lady's you know, wheelchair the cliff, off yeah. the cliff yeah. and, and the like. But uh, why? Was it why? Hillary in that wheelchair? Well, yeah. well there's something to look forward to. Because uh, she is a, a little <laughs> bit old. <laughs> But why, if this is not truly a Ponzi scheme, why are those so-called public service uh, servants spending that money as it comes in rather than it, yeah, setting I mean, it aside? One of the problems that we have faced in our political system is we have liberals and we have conservatives, and of course libertarians, mm -hmm. but uh, l with a modern definition of liberal. I mean, we're, the, the real definition of liberal is libertarian. Classical liberals exactly. are libertarians. But yeah. the modern hijacked. progressive definition, of, you know, the, the, the word, after they stole the word, stole the label from us, yeah. uh, liberals have turned into the people who want to do everything for everybody in return, in exchange for votes. That's that's the in exchange for that's votes. the democratic and model the of getting elected. Control that it gives them over the motivation the is control. The motivation, I mean, I, my my pet theory is that the only people, almost exclusively, who are attracted to politics, attracted to elective politics, and to being bureaucrats, are people who have sociopathic tendencies, people who want to be in control yes. for the most part. Those are the people who uh, actually want to go, all, go to all the trouble it takes to win, a, win an election so that they can exert that power. You don't make a whole lot of money. Well, in some cases you well, do. Well, there's ways of doing that. Yeah. We'll get to that later. Yeah, that's the, you know, yeah. corruption creates that uh, well, opportunity as well. But generally speaking, most uh, of the people who are running for public office are doing so because, hey, I have the answers to making everything perfect. I want to impose them on everybody else. Mm -hmm. And that mindset gets you into a situation where you create all kinds of uh, uh, legislation that solves a problem. People go to their, you know, government, you know, this is a bad thing. Why do, you know, there ought to be a law. Politicians say, oh, I'll make a law. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the politicians, legislature, have they pass a law, have they pass a law to fix the bad thing. And rather than actually the law fixing the bad thing, what, they'll all, what they do is they say, okay, we'll leave the details to an administrative agency. Yeah. 
to oh, actually yes. create rules and regs and regulations and rules and and Falderall in order to actually implement the law. Like the difference between the U.S. code and the, uh, uh, the code of federal regulations. One is passed through uh, legislative bodies, right? And then yep. they issue that to the bureauc bureaucracy, which and the oversight is under executives. Why would you like fire or, or uh, condemn your own right. people? Right. right. And then you look at the rules one to one, like the treasury regulations right. versus the IRS code. It doesn't seem to match up. The right. sections aren't the same. Right. It's really, yeah, it's, it's a terrible. So anyway, you, en you end up with uh, a government run amok. And the liberals are all in favor of this sort of thing. Yeah. And the conservatives the, traditionally, when you've, got, when you've got when you've got when you've got honest money, the conservatives say we can't afford it. You know, the Ron Paul will say oh, we haven't got enough money. But in fact, since the Federal Reserve has the power to increase the money supply, it makes it easy to spend by anything. creating more and more debt, yes. almost exponentially. Yes, the money is there. So conservatives say, well, me too. And that's the problem that we're in. The problem, of course, is that it's a bubble that eventually pops. Mm -hmm. And people have been saying that we're close to popping the debt bubble for a long time. I think we actually are getting close, close to popping that debt bubble, in which case you either repudiate the debt by uh, declaring bankruptcy on the national level or you inflate it away. And my guess is that the last uh, option will be the one that's taken. That's the option that the, uh, the Roman Empire took. They debased the silver coinage. That's the option that countries like Zimbabwe uh, and uh, Venezuela have taken. They have, uh, you know, started printing 100 trillion dollar boulevard or whatever it yeah. is but, notes but like with the romans they had a hard currency backing they now had a hard currency it. originally silver the, the uh, denarium or whatever it was but they started melting down the silver and mixing in zinc and copper right, right. so that, that that's that was the right. ancient so we're way we're operating on a total fiat system now right by so command, we by do it we do it by creating money by lending money either lending money to the government, lending money to consumers for uh, car loans they can't pay back, lending money to businesses so they can buy stock back and you know, bubble the stock market uh, without creating anything new, or lending it to the government, which, which pisses it away entirely. So that's why we end up with this increase in debt that cannot be repaid. Uh, the we only can start way, by liquidating most aspects of government, you know. Well, the, 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 Harry Brown actually, uh, when he ran for uh, uh, president back in back in the uh, '90s, wrote a book on how to liquidate the national debt at that time by selling off all federal land, selling off all assets, selling the courthouses in the national parks and uh, the national forests, etc. Selling everything, liquidating the debt, and starting over with sound money. You could do it back then. I doubt that the real estate is worth $20, $20 trillion. Yeah, I said we can start there. Yes. Is yeah. One of our current presidential That's candidates is selling so. off assets, like selling off uranium rights to the Russians and, 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 and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not exactly... <laughs> they, they, they have plenty that was, of that was uranium a, that was a plutonium. Bit, that was a little bit different to the deal. Uh, but there was a time... The other problem with, with central money, uh, central bank phony, phony money, is it enables <clears throat> the warfare state... Yes. and the uh, proliferation of the offense industry, otherwise known as the defense industry, defense mm -hmm. contractors. Well, uh, their, their, their ability to efficiency, well, you, people uh, rail over the inefficiencies of government contracts, especially in the descent, defense industries. They used to have uh, cost plus contracts. I don't know if they still do it. I, uh, so. And people think, well, how inefficient that, how can they put up with this horrible inefficiency? Now, that's if you presuppose that the actual outcome they're looking for is delivering a certain product within a certain length of time at a certain price. But their, their real purpose in these defense contracts is to um, pay for the lobbyists, bribe the congressmen, keep the workers employed, pay for the engineers, and all the rest of that. So an inefficient uh, defense industry is actually a benefit. Uh, are the military industrial complex running inefficiently because it can spend more money, employs more people, and those, those industries can throw off higher profits. So um, if you have free money, money that you're, you're, you're printing, or in this days of electronics, you're just throwing some extra digits and X's and O's in a and spreadsheet zeros. somewhere, um, then you can um, 
you can afford in their mind to spend this money. And we, we talk about entitlements, even if we, if we cut the military, eliminated it tomorrow completely mm -hmm. and it's relied on the militia, terrible. you would still have um, a huge amount of national well, debt. Well, yeah, and that, I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a... But, uh, but the other problem is that once you have a toy, one, now, not we can't use the children analogy with toys because children will tire of a toy and put it away and go get another toy. But once you have a tank, once you have somebody who, who, who is trained to use a tank or an aircraft carrier and somebody who's trained to use it or, or an, an intelligence agency, and I use that term very loosely, that employs tens of thousands and bribes hundreds of thousands more people, then you pretty much have to use it. And, and what do you use it doing? You use it having uh, either intelligence wars, uh, fomenting rebellion somewhere, having your troops on the ground. You have to use these toys. And, and the only way to use this stuff up, so you have to produce more of it, is by having a war. Or you don't have a war, but you have a phony war with someone else who has the same industry in China or Russia or wherever it is, and then you have a war where nobody has to get hurt, but you have to technologically beat your opponent by producing fancier and fancier toys. Hundred million dollar aircraft, because the Chinese are producing something that goes one mile an hour faster. We have to spend $23 billion on our airplane that goes two miles an hour faster. In some instances, those uh, public servants are issuing contracts to build materiel, weapons and the like, that the military has absolutely no desire for. It's many just times a way in of Congress. The well, yeah, yeah, many and, times and we need to keep, a, a, yeah. keep, a, keep a, our eye on the big picture, too. The, the military and the, if basically creating phony wars, particularly in the Middle East, wars that are not meant to be won, because if they won the war, then they'd have to put yes. their bring their toys home and, 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 and cut back on the, on the size of the Air Force. We're talking about the captains and the sergeants. If you're, We're not talking if you're, about these people. If you're, uh, if you're looking at the entirety of the federal budget, the military is, depending on how, what, how you count it, 20, 30 percent of the budget, 60, uh, full, fully 67 percent, fully two-thirds of the federal budget is in what is called non-discretionary funding. Why is it non-discretionary? Because it's not renewed year after year. It's automatic. The automatic, fund, the automatic spending programs are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, interest on the federal debt primarily, and welfare. Those are the five things that make up uh, two-thirds of the federal budget. And they oh, are on automatic teams. pilot. <laughs> automatic pilot, they don't go away yeah. unless <coughs> legislation is done to specifically stop the funding. Let's see guess if how, somebody get elected guess, doing that. Guess, guess how often that happens. Never. Like, exactly. Yeah. So, I'm never. sorry, was I so, supposed to wait till you're what, done with the question? Time so you never, you never really, at the political level, at the congressional level or the executive level, never really address the elephant in the room, which is the non-discretionary funding. Uh, so you add, take two-thirds, add the, call it 25 percent, for a military, that's uh, 67, 77, 87, you know, call it 90 percent. That leaves only 10 percent of the uh, federal spending that's actually spent on the three-letter agencies, the IRS and the EPA and so forth and so on. And those are the, are the agencies that most people think of when you think of government. They build the roads, they uh, police the airways to make sure planes don't run into each other. They, you know, they do, in some cases, useful things, in other cases, uh, things that are, you know, the opposite of useful, but at least they're, they're, they're doing something. Most of what money, of the federal money, is spent on, on people who are dependent in one way or another on taxpayer revenue. I'm talking about yes. people my age who are Social Security recipients sure. or mm -hmm. Medicare recipients, people uh, younger who are on disability because it's easier than looking for a job uh, and they can get by with it, uh, people who are uh, in grade school and high school age who are getting free education, so-called. Those are the, that's, that's, where the, that's where the vast majority of money is being spent. Yes, and there, and there are some costs above and beyond the budget, such as the uh, the regulatory burden on productive industries and entrepreneurs that 
make yeah. it tremendously expensive to do business. We'll do it. We'll do an entire show on that. We'll do that. We'll and do also, an entire show yeah. on that. Another problem that we have is in order to keep the population in line, in order to keep the taxpayers uh, from going into actual rebellion, you have to have a reason. Gotta keep them docile. You ha well, you know, you have to keep them scared. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? The phony wars are part of that, saying that uh, Iraq is going to nuke us, or that North Korea is going to nuke us, or that uh, terrorists from uh, Syria are going to come to the United States and blow up our shopping malls. Oh, I thought we were bringing the war in. on oh. terror. <laughs> the war on terror is uh, another phony war that you have less of a chance of dying in a terrorist attack anywhere than you do of getting hit by lightning, literally. I think it's, you could actually say probably meteorite yeah, and yeah. still be accurate because yes. lightning strikes the are point is, common. The point is that the war on terror is a political construct used to keep the population in line and also used to justify thousands of millions of dollars being spent on invasion of privacy oh, through the tens uh, of billions through the uh, the NSA and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, CIA and all of the all of the spy organizations that are run by the federal government not to mention the state level I um, I agree Richard um, that and we'll, we'll talk about terror if, if people are afraid um, they many people are willing to give up freedoms in order to uh, acquire security. Now, this happens in a, in a normal <coughs> market. Uh, what you do is you will take a less risky investment for a lower rate of return, or you know that if you get a high rate of return that uh, there is a tremendous amount of risk. Now, freedom entails risk, but this is not a, a, a war on, on, on a real threat. This is a war on an imaginary threat that has been blown out of proportion, and some would say that the tiny threat that actually exists has been created by our ineptitude or been created intentionally by some really cynical politicians so that they have a threat to point to. We started out this conversation talking about how all of this uh, phony money creation will, is, is leading to a bubble of debt that will yeah, eventually yeah. implode. And the way it will implode probably is through inflation, through uh, price inflation. Now, we've had inflation for the last 10, 15 years. The problem is, or the, the reason we haven't noticed it is because it's been asset inflation. The, mm. the stock market keeps going up. Why is the stock market going up? Because, because corporations dollar. are borrowing money. <laughs> to buy back their stock, pure and simple. That's a big part of it. The money supply has been increasing dramatically. It's been going into assets as opposed to in, into bread and butter and gasoline. Eventually, uh, corporations will be at the limit of how much they can borrow to do that. They'll be at a point where they can no longer service the debt. Eventually, interest rates will probably go back up again. We may be at that point now. Once that happens, the only way for the government to get out from under the threat is to start uh, continuing to increase uh, the money supply, but doing it by uh, increasing deficit spending even more than already is the case. That's a form of theft, isn't it? Well, of course. But the point is, what will happen is it'll actually start going into prices and wages. And the solution, of course, will be the Venezuelan uh, solution, wage and price controls. What's Starvation. The, what's the libertarian position on wage and price controls? <laughs> It's, it's inappropriate. We can go back uh, to um, World War II when the huge military requirement for personnel left em remaining uh, employers in the mainland with a shortage of skilled, capable personnel. So they started outbidding each other. and uh, Causing wage inflation. Well, you could call it that. And Franklin Roosevelt says, we can't have this. You cannot increase your wages to attract personnel, but he didn't say anything about uh, fringe benefits, as we call them, leading to prepaid medical care. You can call it insurance if you want to, but uh, uh, that was the step at which people thought they no longer had any personal responsibility for taking care of themselves. That was uh, their health, uh, their health, yeah. whatever. That was up to somebody else. and. Uh, 
David Bowes argues um, on that point too. Uh, one of the books, uh, one of my favorite books of all time is The Libertarian Mind. It's an updated version of an earlier book he wrote. And uh, one of the sections is about these fringe benefits and how normally, like in a libertarian position, if we were given the option from getting actual justified market rate income versus these, these back-end benefits like uh, medical coverage, we would take the cash up front but they've been, the, the system has been pushing more, uh, to a certain extent, more assets into this back-end thing, like the health plans. Like when I was working at Macy's, they made me sign a bunch of stuff. I said, I said, I don't want this. I want more commission, higher rate of commission, and higher pay. Um, but they're like, that's not how it works. It's already been decided. Mm -hmm. So if, if people were actually given an option to, to leverage the, the productivity that they had and to get the money that was worth for the work that they were giving, then I think they, they would start choosing greater assets up front or uh, more cash where they can themselves choose where they were to put the money, maybe put it in a private health care plan. Um, but when you take away these decision-making capabilities from the actual workers, from the people, then you have all kinds of secondary factors you have to deal with. So I thought that was a very interesting point. And, and more recently, uh, we have uh, a crusade mm -hmm. to pay the, the low well, lowly workers, I hate to insult anybody, but uh, entry-level workers, a minimum of something like $15 an hour. Yeah. And uh, There the, goes uh, that wage inflation you well, were talking and, about and, and right there's there. A, there's a great example that goes along with this. Uh, Mr. Puzder, who's the uh, uh, CEO of uh, Carl Karcher Enterprises, that's uh, Carl's Junior Restaurant and Hardy's Restaurant, said that with the current wage structure, each of their employees generates $6,000 of profit for the parent company each year. If minimum wage were to be made $15 an hour, each employee would be costing the parent company, costing the parent company $6,000 a year. Untenable. So the consequence is well, automation. The, the, yeah, either automation or higher hamburger prices. Yeah, and well, he said, and, we can't, and, we can't and, charge more for hamburgers, but, so we're going to automate, no, and that's the, happening. The powers that be would much rather, much rather, that they charged more for hamburgers. You charge more for hamburgers, then the mechanic has to charge more for his, you more mean, for by his... the powers that be, you're talking about yeah. the, um, the crooks that, uh, the crooks that make that, these laws. The crooks that make these laws. They would much rather have wage <clears throat> and no, price No, no, they, they want you to free all the profits. That's what they want. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's uh, okay. Well, at this point, at the, when, the, when the system starts to crumble, they would much rather have wage and price inflation. Right now... What they what they want to do is is uh, buy some votes with offering a phony solution to a non-existent problem, which is guaranteeing people who don't have the economic um, the economic benefit to charge fifteen dollars an hour for their services. Mm -hmm. The economic benefit is probably more like five or six dollars an hour, but they're already being forced to pay them at nine dollars an hour. 15, so that's a problem, but so one eventually... Of the, one of the consequences, yeah. pretty predictably, is that uh, entry-level people who don't have a lot of skills aren't worth $15 an hour. So you're shutting them out of the marketplace. Yeah. We have just a few minutes left. I would like to go to one more totally Please unrelated do. topic, which is what is the libertarian solution to protecting the uh, environment? Tim? Yeah, I guess it's evolved over the years. Um, one example that came to mind recently um, like regarding, um, specifically regarding like wildlife, um, lions and tigers and bears, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. In Africa, they've privatized the, the, um, um, the territories uh, where these animals roam, and they've been uh, sometimes privatized, sometimes under the uh, public sector control, but they started charging for things like um, prize hunting. Uh, and, and they've said the actual results the actual results uh, have showed that because people were money uh, paying money into the system to maintain this, they were actually able to pay personnel and, and to maintain a, a balance of wildlife there versus before it was just kind of like people coming in there and, and, and doing whatever they want. Um, and those not, are not the most successful governments um, or successful societies in the world, a lot of uh, unstable issues there. But regarding here, I mean, the environment in California, I keep thinking about um, drug policy reform. 
there's, there's going to be so much regulations um, and time spent on figuring out water control issues, land development issues, agricultural opportunities. Um, and unfortunately, it's being primarily handled by state um, and uh, other government agencies. We don't have too much say in that. So we're trying to weasel away our way in there. Um, but protecting the environment uh, outside of privatizing, um, I can't think of any new novel. Well, you know, I, I mean, I look at it this way. The, the environment is something that every, you know, a clean environment, clean air, clean water, uh, et cetera, are, you know, uh, uh, preservation of, of, uh, of species and so forth. Those are things that are universal wants. There's nobody in the world, nobody in the country that wants to have there are some people dirty who water. Like cats. They might. Speak for yourself. Yeah. Dirty water or dirty air. You know, people don't want that. And if all land, all resources were owned privately, nobody would pollute their own land. I mean, I grew up on a farm. We owned a lot of land. We made sure that there, for, for self-interest reasons, we made sure that the uh, sloping hillside fields were, were uh, uh, contour planted, uh, used terraces, did whatever we could to prevent erosion of the precious topsoil so that the sediment wouldn't rush down into the, ultimately into the Mississippi River in the Gulf of Mexico with all the uh, pesticides and so forth. We were very much interested in, in, in preservation of the productive value of the farmland. Private ownership means conservation. Private ownership means protection, protection of the environment. Where you have a problem with environmental degradation is where the tragedy of the commons comes in. Where does the tragedy of the commons come in? It comes in where resources are not uh, privately owned. The oceans are a good example. They're owned, you know, nobody owns the oceans. So you have overfishing, you have uh, pollution of the oceans. Uh, the, 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 uh, the phrase tragedy of the, of the commons comes from old, I think old England, medieval England, where you would have a town square, a meadow in, in the town square upon which people could graze their sheep or cattle. It's overgrazed. And everybody's interest was to graze as many sheep or cattle on that piece of land as, as they could possibly get away with, which meant that it got overgrazed. If the commons, if that land was owned privately, You'd rotate pastures. You would uh, only have as many cattle or, or sheep on the on the uh, pasture as the uh, uh, pasture could carry. You would not overgraze. That's the significance, and that's the beauty of private ownership as uh, as opposed to ownership as to tragedy of the commons. We see a tragedy of the commons as well uh, in the uh, uh, land that's owned by the National Forest Service, by the by the uh, by the national forests or the national wilderness areas. You have forest fires that are horrendous because nobody is clearing out the timber. Nobody is harvesting the timber. It's allowed to grow into thickets and uh, you have fire suppression so that those thickets get even worse so that when you do have a fire, it's even worse than it would, it would have, have been otherwise. You have a fire storm. You have a fire storm, yeah. yeah. 